morning. Okay, folks. <clears throat> so let's get started. Um, again, a reminder that the mystery project is out there and due date is closer than you think. So if you're working on it, good. If you're not working on it, get started, okay? In fact, I want to start off today with um, kind of a review of where we are. So we talked about defining multiples, and we talked about price earnings ratios, and price to book, and EV to EBITDA, and EV to sales, and we passed them through the test. Then we looked at the distribution, the data. What's high, what's low, what's average, let the data tell you. And then we talked about analyzing a multiple. If it's an equity multiple, go back to a dividend discount model or an equity valuation model. Do the algebra, and you can tell me what drives a PE ratio or a price to book ratio. If you're an enterprise value multiple, go back to a firm valuation model, do the algebra, you'll see the drivers. And then we talked about applying, and we went through a series of examples with each multiple. What do you control for? How do you decide? But at the end of the process, when you sit down to price your company, not value your company, and by now you, have, you should get a sense of what I mean by pricing a company rather than valuing it. You could price it based on a PE ratio, price to book. You could take each of these multiples and you can get a price, and the price prices could all be potentially different. You think, so what? Well, let's say I have an agenda. Who doesn't, right? Anytime somebody uses numbers, they have an agenda. I want to sell you something. I want to buy something from you. I get to pick the multiple, and I get to tell the story, right? So to kind of start this process off, I pulled this page off, an equity research report, I think, on Facebook. Again, I'm not going to use it to kind of draw any deep lessons. But if you look at the top half of this table, there are one, two, three, uh, there's EV to EBITDA with three different measures of earnings. There's EV to revenue with three different measures of revenues. Last year's revenues, this year's revenues, next year's revenues, and price earnings. So I have nine different multiples, essentially, for these companies. Okay. Now, if you let me decide which multiple I want to focus on, and I have an agenda. I want to show you that Facebook is cheaper expensive. You can already see you've conceded the game to me. And then to give the analyst credit, he's also thrown in things that he thinks matters, like margin and growth. And... But here's the question I'm going to start off with. Okay? You do relative valuation with a bunch of different multiples for your company. Okay? So let's assume that you have a software company. You're trying to decide which multiple to use in your valuation. So you've tried 10 of them, right? price earnings, price to book, EV to EBITDA. You think, which one should I hang my hat on? I'll give you the choices, and you can tell me which of these choices you would adopt in the pricing of your company. You're going to face this challenge in a few weeks when you have to price your company, the company you did the big DCF on. So the first is, you say, I won't pick one. I'll take an average across the 10. You could do that, right? You've got 10 different pricings for your company based on different multiples. You could take the average. The problem with doing that, though, is you're adding bad stuff with good stuff, precise stuff with imprecise stuff, throwing them all into the mix. Well, maybe the way to do this is to take a weighted average, but you, know, you have to decide then what the weights are. Maybe you'd pick the multiple that most analysts in this sector use to look at your company. So you're in, um, looking at a cable company. Most analysts might use EV to EBITDA multiples. They said, that's what I'm going to stick with because that's the standard. You might use the multiple that best captures what other investors are pricing companies in the sector on, which means you've got to find what that variable is. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how we get there, but I'm going to draw on statistics to do it. You can pick the multiple that best incorporates the fundamentals that drive value, cash flows, growth, and risk, again, using statistics. Or maybe the answer is none of the above. So when you get to that, <clears throat> that point in the process where you're pricing your company, I want you to start thinking about how you're going to decide, because ultimately I want one pricing for your company, and you can't give me 10 different prices. How do you decide which price to take? 
Any ideas? Single multiple, weighted average of multiples, and if it's a single multiple, which one? See, ranges are cover your butt answers, right? Because what does a range do? I have to buy at a price. That's the problem. So I'm not saying that your valuation doesn't have a range. But ultimately, what's the question you have to answer? At today's price, would you, and you know what the range is going to tell you? There is, I'm almost, I don't think I've ever valued a company where the price has fallen out of my range. Because the range is going to be broadened up. So you can do ranges if you're a banker or you're a consultant and you don't have to have actually do something with that number. But ultimately, even if you have a range, I want, that's why we talk about medians and base case, is ranges are fine because that's the way the numbers play out. But a range is not going to help me make my decision. So you can do a range, but it's neither here nor there. Any other ideas? I'll tell you how most people pick multiples. Talked about agendas. You didn't do your DCF already, right? You found your company to be either undervalued or overvalued. What's your end game here? You want to finish your project quickly. And you want it to be neat and tied up. Guess what you're going to be drawn towards? Whichever multiple backs up your DCF. It makes your life a lot simpler. You don't have to write, the, on the one hand, I found this. So, so I know this is coming. So a lot of you are going to find, I found a multiple that gave me exactly the same number for my company as my DCF. Don't worry, you don't have any moral or ethical dilemmas when you do it. You're doing exactly what's rational for you at that point in time. And remember that when you see somebody else using a multiple and comparables on you, is they have an agenda, they're going to find a way to pick a multiple that backs up that agenda. So we'll come back and address this more carefully, but it's something I want you to start thinking about. So let's keep working on this Xilof, this software company. Let's assume that you've computed, you know, done a DCF valuation and come up with $10 per share, the stock is trading at 15. So based on your DCF, it looks overvalued. But let's say you do the pricing, you do it honestly, and you come up with a pricing of 20. So I have one price. The stock is actually trading at 15. Your intrinsic valuation says it should be valuing at 10. But when you use PE ratios, EV to EBITDA, or some pricing, you come up with a conclusion that should really be priced at 20. So which of the following conclusions would you draw? The stock is undervalued. The stock is overvalued. The stock is correctly valued. The stock is both under and overvalued. I don't know exactly how you'd write that report. Or maybe it's none of the above. How would you, if I asked you to characterize your findings to me in one sentence, how would you characterize your findings? Do you want to give it a shot? How would you, how would you describe what you've just found? This is why I introduced two words, valued and priced, right? And the, uh, go ahead. Okay, so use both then. So can something be undervalued and overpriced? Sure, they're two different games. The reason I want you to think about these games is when you're playing the valuation game, obviously you're not investing in the stock because you think the stock is price too high. But if you're playing the pricing game, how do you make money? You buy at 20 and you hope to sell at 23. Who cares what the value is? In fact, today the first example I'm going to start off with is a pure pricing game. I said, forget about this DCF stuff. We don't care anymore. We want to make money in markets. We're buying at a lower price and selling at a higher price. And if you play the pricing game, you really don't care about intrinsic value anymore. Now do you see why when you bring a DCF to a trader, he says, I don't care? When you have a six week or a six month or a six hour time horizon, who cares what the DCF of a company is? It's a pricing game. And that's something we want to come back to and talk about again today because it's not a bad game. It's not a less noble game. It's just a different way of playing this game. So what you will do based on these numbers will depend on whether you're an investor or a trader. If you're an investor, you're not going to buy the stock. If you're a trader, all bets are off. You buy it at 20, hoping to sell at 22. It's a different kind of game you're playing. 
And finally, let's think about how you price companies. You price them based on comparables, right? Today, we're going to actually talk about expanding our list of comparables beyond just the peer group. So let's assume that when I price Xyloft using you know, the software companies, I come up with one number, and then I price it against the entire market. Remember, I can pick comparables as the entire market. I come up with a pricing of $10 per share. So based against other software companies, it's price, it's, it should be priced to 20. Based against the entire market, it should be priced to 10. So pricing here is giving me two different signals. Now here, actually, I'm asking you how you get judged, right? So if you're an equity research analyst, how do you get judged? You get judged based on how other people in the same sector are doing. So if you come up with three stocks that are down 20%, you look like a hero if everybody else picks stocks that are down 50%. So today we're going to also talk about how the way you get judged and evaluated can affect. It's, a, it, 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 it's not as rational as it sounds when you first take a valuation class. Value the company. The price is higher than the value. Don't buy the stock. It's a much messier game once you introduce incentives, the way you're judged, and how you make money into the process. So let me start off by going back to, I think we were on page 74. And talk about how pricing works. And I'm going to use a company that I kind of track for about five years, and I still continue to track. And it's Whole Foods. When Whole Foods first came into the business, the analysts who followed the sector it was in had no idea what to do with it. Because the sector it is in is the grocery store sector, traditionally a low growth, really low margin business. And Whole Foods came along. It looked very different from everybody else. So I started in January 2007. That was right after Whole Foods had gone public. It was the star growth company. And it did a scatter plot of price to sales ratios. I should have done EV to sales, but I kind of got sloppy. I did price to sales and net margin. So there's the entire grocery store sector, all lying next to the line, and there's Whole Foods. And of course, if you looked at the equity research reports in 2007, you know what they told me? Whole Foods is okay. It looks expensive, but it's okay because its margins are so much higher than everybody else's. Now, part of that statement is true. Their margins were much higher than everybody else. Their margins were 3.41%. Everybody else was at 1, 1.5% 1 margins. But even if I plug that margin into the regression that I got from price to sales, the predicted price to sales ratio I'd have got with their higher margins would have been 0.43. They were trading at 1.41 times revenues. So in 2007, as I was reading the equity research reports, I could see the true part of the story, but I still couldn't understand why it, was, it should trade at a premium on the rest of the sector, but not this much. So let's say I'm a trader, right? Basically, I'm, so this looks like it's an overpriced stock, right? I'm not using the word value because I haven't valued the company. It's an overpriced stock. So what, we're, what are you going to do? You're going to sell short on the stock and hope and pray that it moves back towards the line. Well, if you'd done that two years later, you'd have been very happy. So I take the same sector in, in January 2009. Now look at where Whole Foods is. It actually has gone from being the most overvalued Overpriced, I have to even, you know, I keep slipping up. The most overpriced stock in the sector to the most underpriced stock in the sector. Yep. That's a good point. It's a relative statement. Does everybody get the point? All I've said is the price to sales ratio has dropped towards the lowest end of the sector, but you could still have lost money, right? Because the entire sector drops by 80%. You've lost less money than everybody else, but you're still losing money. So is there a way that as an investor I can control for that? Let's say as an investor, I think I'm really good at pricing individual stocks, but I worry about sector risk. What could I do? Well, because there's a high margin uh, business, they, they go they actually got hurt even more than the other. OK, so it might have to do with the macro. But let's suppose I want to take sector risk out of this equation. What could I do? Can I hedge against sector risk? This is one of the great pluses we have with ETFs. Increasingly, as you start getting sector ETFs, and you can, and I think of at least 20 sectors where you can get ETFs, you know what you're going to do, right? You're going to sell short on Whole Foods 
And if you can buy the sector index, in this case a grocery stock ETF, you can hedge against sector risk so you're still making money even if the entire sector drops. So in 2009, the stock has gone to being, so now you not just reverse the sell short, you now go buy shares in Whole Foods. Yeah. See, this is the thing, in pricing, never ask the question, why is it happening? You really don't care. That's an intrinsic value question. It's well worth asking, digging for answers, but in pricing, you gotta be shallow. You gotta just say, look, you know, it's, it's, my job is to play the pricing game. I don't want to get too deep about why it's happening, because no matter what the reason is, if I make money on it, who cares? So, but in an intrinsic valuation, that those are exactly the questions. Why is this happening? You know, why, do, why are the margins collapsing? But essentially in pricing, all you care about is that surface relationship because that's how you make money. Then I get to 2010. Now let's look at Whole Foods again. Gone back to being overvalued. So it went overvalued in 2007 to under, I'm sorry, overpriced in 2007, underpriced in 2009, back to being overpriced in 2010, and we get to 2011. For a brief moment, it's right on the line. This is like watching a manic depressive, right? Markets don't seem to be able to make up their mind as to what to do with the stock, and there's a reason for that. It's, remember what I said, analysts had no idea what to do with Whole Foods. Because it did not, they, they were so used to Safeway and Kroger's, these old, stable, low margin businesses, that he threw Whole Foods in the mix, they had no idea. So what they reacted to was whatever the most recent information was, and the information is good, they overshoot. The information is bad, they undershoot. And this is good for the rest of us. So here's my suggestion. Whole Foods is now gone. It's now very much part of the mainstream, but there's a new kid in town. There's a, co a company called Sprouts, it's a California-based, uh, it's, it's a high margin, high growth company. My suggestion is, latch on to Sprouts. Track it for a few years, and if you have the guts, play the game, right? Go out and, you know, in this case you can see, it's now the overpriced stock, you sell short in it. And if history is any guide, and you have the capacity to wait this out, it will get back, not just to the line, but below the line, and you're going to be able to take advantage as the, it'll take about, I don't know how many years, it, it, took, it took the market 10 years to get used to Amazon. So it kind of zigzagged along the line. The same thing happens any time you have an outlier in a business. You know where this is coming next? In the financial services businesses. Because you're going to get the disruptors, the lending trees and the lending clubs of the world, and you have no idea what to do with them because they're so used to the old financial service companies. You're going to apply the price to book ratio rule that used to work for you, and you're going to come up with these really strange conclusions about these companies, and you're going to get these zigzags around the line because people take a while to learn how to price these companies. So now let's get to desperation time. Every example I've given you so far, I've been able to explain away the multiple, right? Price to book, here, yeah, look at the return equity. Price to sales, look at the margin. Price earnings, look at the growth. But what if nothing works? Remember the January 2000 valuation I did of Amazon, my DCF? This was like six sessions ago. And it, even if you don't remember, let me review what I concluded. I concluded at the time, January 2000, that the stock was massively overvalued. The stock was at $84, and I came up with a value of 34, and I said, don't buy this stock. I decided to see if I could confirm my decision by looking at the pricing of Amazon. So I looked at Amazon relative to other dot-com companies in January 2000, and I plotted them on a chart. Again, price to sales against margin. Notice how the margin axis is scaled. It goes from minus 100% to 0%. Out of the 50 companies in my peer group, only one was making money, AOL. The remaining 49 were losing money. It's a question of how much money they were losing. I took one look at this graph, and I knew I was in trouble. You see why, right? What am I trying to do? I'm trying to fit a line through these points, and this looks like a shotgun blast. Undaunted, I decided to run the regression. I knew what I was going to find, 
and I found exactly what I expected, an R squared close to zero, and a regression with very strange output. Very strange output in what sense? Price to sales ratio is 81.36. This is revenue multiple. That's your base. 81 times revenues is what you're starting with. And every 1% increase in my net margin reduces my price to sales ratio by 7.0754 or whatever it works out to. That's strange, right? The more money you lose, the higher your price. So if you were a believer in irrational exuberance, this would be exhibit one, right? You lose money, you lose more money, I price you at an even higher price. But that would be a little unfair, and here's why. When you bought a dot-com stock in January 2000, or if you buy a social media company today, you're not buying it because of how much money it made last year, right? Why are you buying it? You're buying it for potential. You're buying it for potential. You still worry about things. Will it survive? Will it make money? But who cares about what the net income was last year? So here are a couple of things you can do if you have a sector like this one, and your company is in a sector where it's tough to explain differences. You can use proxies for whatever investors seem to be focused on. So I'll throw a few hypotheses at you. I told you there were 50 companies in this sector. I had the multiple of revenues for each company. It turns out that small companies traded much higher multiples of revenues than big ones, simply because scaling up is tough to do. If you have a million dollars in revenues, trading at 50 times revenues is not a big deal. But a billion dollars in revenues, it gets more difficult. So I'm going to hypothesize that the more revenues I have as a company, the lower the multiple of revenues I should expect to see. Second, I would also hypothesize that the higher the growth rate I expect to see in revenues, the more value I should attach to your company. You have no earnings, but I want your revenues to grow, scale up. Third, I know that some of your companies will not make it. And in this space, you know how that showed up, that your company got into trouble? You ran out of cash. When you ran out of cash, you had to go raise capital. That's when companies ran into a wall. So I looked to see whether I could come up with a proxy for survival. And what I used was I looked at how much cash a company had as a percentage of revenues. The more cash you have, the greater the chance you will survive. Very rough proxies, but I took my 50 companies. I looked at the level of revenues. I used the log of revenues to kind of scale. You're saying, why log? He's saying, a, a, a statistics professor will kill me for saying this. Whenever you get huge variation in your independent variables, the lowest number is a million, the highest number is 600 billion. One way to kind of make your regressions work without blowing up is to take the natural log of the numbers. It just kind of narrows the difference and makes your regressions more manageable. So I took the log of revenues. I took revenue growth. The, in, in this case, I used historical growth because I didn't have predicted growth. And I used cash as a percent of revenue to capture the survival effect. The coefficients all had the right sign on them, which is good news. The higher my revenues, the lower my price to sales ratio, which makes sense. The higher my revenue growth, the higher my price to sales ratio. And the more cash I have as a company, the higher my price to sales ratio. The T statistics are all, you know, at least for revenue growth and cash, are significant. The level of revenues I could have taken out of the regression. Maybe I should have, because in a sense, the T is well below two. But the R squared that I got at 32% might sound disappointing, except in this sector. I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. This is going to be as good as it gets with the existing data. But I had now have a regression equation that tells me what the price to sales ratio should be for a dot com company in January 2000. Yep. That there's a, that's any time you run a multiple regression, and this is something we're going to talk about more when we look at market regressions. Now, in the statistics class, any time you run a multiple regression, your independent variables are supposed to be uncorrelated with each other. In fact, if they're correlated, statistics professors kind of freak out and they give it this big, long name. Do you remember what that was? Multicollinearity. I remember hearing, so who the hell cares? Now I know why you should care, because when the variables start to be correlated with each other, remember, what does a computer see when you put these four columns? doesn't see growth and level. It just sees four sets of numbers. And if they all tend to move together, it gets really confused about what exactly you're measuring with each number. So the bad news is these coefficients could be a very, they might be not right. The good news is the collective regression still works. The forecasting part of the entire regression is not thrown off. 
It's the individual coefficients that you have to be careful about. So we'll come back and talk about this in the context of market regression. But yeah, go ahead. It's really not, right? Basically, what I'm looking at is the cash balance you have as a company. In fact, analysts used to use this ratio called the cash burn ratio. Have you heard about this? Basically, what they used to do, especially in the dot-com era, is take your cash balance and divide it by your EBITDA, which was a negative number. What they were looking for is how many months of cash do you have as a company before you have to go back to the market. The rationale being the more months you can put that off, the safer you are as a company. So I'm not even trying to measure the value of the company. I'm just trying to measure how quickly you will have to go back to the market to raise capital. And the more quickly you have to go back, the more I worry about your survival. It's kind of, a, as I said, a very rough proxy for survival because I can't use things like bond ratings because they don't have any debt. I can't do interest coverage ratios because their operating income is a loss. So all the traditional avenues of measuring default risk get cut off. So I went with this cash number as my proxy for survival risk. Now, why was it doing this? Just to see if my original conclusion about Amazon was right. So what I did was I plugged in Amazon's revenues, revenue growth, 199% was their growth rate in the previous year, and their cash ratio in. And what I got as a predicted price to sales ratio was 30.42. The stock was actually trading at 25.6 times revenues. So in January 2000, I could have given you entirely contradictory messages. On an intrinsic value standpoint, I'm going to say, don't touch the stock. It's massively overpriced. But then I could turn around and say, you know what? But it's also cheap relative to other dot-com companies. And a year later, both those conclusions would have been confirmed. Stock was down to 11. There's my intrinsic valuation paying off. But Amazon dropped only 85%. You say, what do you mean only 85%? The rest of the sector was down 94%. That is the heart of relative valuation. Is you're not telling me that a stock is cheap or expensive. You're saying it's cheap or expensive relative to these other companies that I compare it to. It's a weakest link, and that's the point that I was making about how do you protect yourself against that. But that's the weakest link in pricing. It's always a relative statement. Any questions? So that's the first solution. Work with proxies to that. Here's the second one. It's called using a forward multiple. Let me explain what a forward multiple is. One of the problems we have with young companies, and I'm not just talking about Amazon in early 2000, it could be Snap a few weeks from now when it goes public, is usually the way we compute multiples is we take the market cap today and we divide by numbers today. So Snap right now is revenues of only about 350 million. Its expected pricing is going to be 25 billion. If I divide 25 billion by 350 million, I'll save you the trouble. I'm going to get a value to sales multiple of 75. And that's going to horrify. I mean, you, you say, that's horrifically high. But the problem I'm having is not with the market cap, but with the fact that there isn't much in the company right now. So one way I can solve this is rather than dividing the market cap today by the revenues today, I could divide the market cap today by expected revenues in five years. See how this solves your problem a little bit? Because if you have high growth and you project revenues out five years, it's going to be much more substantial. So you can say, look, you know, it's trading at only three times 2022 revenues. And many analysts who follow young companies follow this tactic of projecting out revenues or projecting out earnings and applying today's market cap as a multiple of that number. There's nothing wrong with doing this, but if you do this, you've got to do this for all the companies in your sector, right? So if you have 15 social media companies and you want to do this, you've got to project out, which you can. And after you project it out and come up with the number, that's your expected value in 2014, two, I'm sorry, 2022, 2023, 2024. Now, when we did DCF, this is very much like a terminal value concept, right? Basically, you're getting a a pricing in, te in five or six or seven years. Remember what we had to do in DCF with that terminal value? First, we had to discount it back to today, adjusting for risk and the time value of money. And then we had to subtract out all those cash flows we would have until we got to Nirvana. And those cash flows were often negative cash flows. So that terminal value, by the time you got to value today, was a much smaller number. And whenever I value a young growth company, just to keep myself honest, 
I check to see how much my terminal value loses as I go from the value then to today. So about uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, when I valued Tesla, I decided to take this apart because when I finished my valuation, what people were looking at said, they're looking at the terminal value number. And it was giving them a value per share, about four times higher than the value per share that I was estimating. And they're saying, what's going on here? How come that 45 or 60 or $150 you have in your 10 is becoming $10 today? So I went from my terminal value down to today. And here are the steps. First, I start with the terminal value. So you can take the, your DCF and try this out. I discounted the terminal value at the risk-free rate. You know what that corrects for? Pure time value. No risk adjustment. So pure time value. So I lose about, no, that, I already lose about 16 billion. 68 billion became 52 billion. Then I used a risk adjusted rate, the, the cost of capital that I have. The value drops to 28 billion. So my 68 billion became 52 billion with the risk free rate. Putting in the risk premium knocks down another 25 billion. That's a risk effect. Then I adjusted for the fact that I have negative cash flows in the first six years. That, that's a dilution effect my 28 billion becomes 12.9 billion. And then I brought in the chance that there's a 10% likelihood that the company will not make it. The 12.9 billion becomes 12.2 billion. And after I subtracted out debt and added back cash, that became about 11.8 billion. And then I adjusted for the options outstanding. The value of equity I came up with for this company was 8 billion. 68 billion in my terminal value. By the time I'm done with all the cleaning up, for time value, for risk, for negative cash flows, for debt, for cash, for the chance that the company will not make it has become eight billion. Now, in discounted cash flow valuation, this kind of takes care of itself because you're forced to do it. But the problem when you use pricing is because you're not forced to do it, you can get sloppy. See what I mean by that? I could give you a pricing for Tesla of 68 or 70 or 75 billion in year 10, but if I don't adjust for all the stuff that's going to happen over the next 10 years, and just take the 75 billion, divide by the number of shares, I'm gonna get an absurdly high pricing for the company. So that's something to factor in. Whenever you use forward multiples, just remember to be careful to adjust for the time value of money, which means you gotta discount back that number, adjust for risk at the cost of capital, and adjust for the chance your company will not make it. So if you're valuing a young startup, often they're priced now, based upon an exit multiple, which is very much like a forward multiple, you come up with the value at the end of year three or year five, you got to bring it back to today, you got to adjust for negative cash flows, you have to adjust for equity, so do all the stuff you did in a DCF to kind of clean up, because that number is not the pricing you should be paying today. So one final way in which you can deal with this issue. So let's suppose you have to price a company. Remember in pricing, you let the market tell you what matters, right? It's not your job and my job to say, this is what should matter. This is what the market thinks should matter. So about three years ago when I was value, valuing Twitter for the, prior to their IPO, I did my DCF valuation and I came up with like $18 per share. I decided I wanted to price Twitter. So I went and collected data on other social media companies that were already publicly traded. And there's my list right there. I collected the market cap of these companies, which if it's publicly traded is out there. And I also collected a bunch of accounting data on all these companies, revenues, EBITDA, EBIT. And I also collected the number of users that each of these companies had. Now I want to figure out how the market is pricing these companies, right? So I wanted to see which variable, which of these things is the market latching onto? So I opened up my statistics book again, and I did a correlation matrix. If you've ever worked with data, this is just you know, easy output when you have the data. What does a correlation matrix tell me? tell me? It basically tells me what's driving the market cap. What are the variables that best explain the market cap? So let's focus just on the first column. The market cap and enterprise value are almost perfectly correlated because there's no debt and very little cash. The two obviously move together. So let's focus on the rest of the variables. The correlation between market cap and revenues is about 89%. That's not bad. That's pretty good. The correlation between market cap and EBITDA is about 97%. The correlation with net income is about 90%, but the correlation with the number of users is about 98%. Now, what does that tell me? It tells me that more than any other variable, the variable that drives the pricing of social media companies is the number of users in that company. Now, you could say, that's absurd, that's so irrational. 
Remember, that's an intrinsic value thought in your mind. Set it to the side. This is a pricing. This is what the market seems to care about. And in fact, if you go back to the previous page, the market, if you look at the median number, seems to be paying about $100 per user. Remember, you're the banker. Twitter's come to you and said, we want to go public. What's your mission, a pricing mission or a value mission? It's a pricing mission and an IPO. Who cares what the value is? You have to price the company. You could do a DCF and come up with a value, but you're dancing a kabuki dance. Or you have to price the company. And what does this table tell you? That the market's willing to pay a hundred. You ready? Let's price Twitter. Twitter has about 240 million users at the time of the IPO. Market's paying a hundred dollars per user. So what's your pricing of Twitter? 240 times 100 is 24 billion. They're done. They're saying, but I can't charge the 6% investment banking fee. So you have to do a DC, you have to make it. So do all that stuff, but you've got the number already. In fact, Twitter went public. The offering price was set at 26. On the opening day, the, off, the first day of trading, it traded at 45, which coincidentally maybe was about $24 billion. Think how much time and effort you'd have saved yourself. Said, just multiply by $100, be done. So that's why when you see VCs apply these pricing multiples, don't be so quick to pass judgment on them. It's their job to price companies. And if this is how everybody else is pricing the company, number of users, number of downloads, number of apps, number of subscribers, there's nothing wrong with pricing based on that if that is the game you're playing. So with pricing, set everything we've talked about in terms of fundamentals and what should matter to the side. Eventually, they will matter. In fact, I've used this term before, and I'll use it again. When, market, when companies go public, especially these young companies, markets price them based on things like users and subscribers. But there's that bar mitzvah moment coming, right? Another moment is when the market says, oh, users were nice, but when are you going to start making money? You say, really? I have to make money? I thought all I had to do was collect more users. You got to be ready for that moment, because if you're not, that's when your market price will fall. So if you look at good young companies versus bad ones, that's really the difference. So good ones actually manage their companies on both channels at the same time. Deliver whatever the market wants right now, but at the same time, you have to be working to be ready for the bar mitzvah moment. That's really the difference between Facebook and Twitter, if you look at the last three years. Facebook has always been managed with the objective of we know eventually revenues and earnings will count and we have to deliver them. And while we will deliver users and user intensity and all that neat stuff for the moment, we'll work on the other channel as well. Twitter seemed to have lost that message. So when their bar mitzvah moment came, they were in trouble. Yep. Markets have become more sophisticated now. They're not pricing based on number of users. They're pricing based on user intensity. Scary thought. We, you know what user intensity is going to measure? How much time are you spending? So now what's happening in social media companies is not only do they want to show you how many users they have, they also are showing you how many minutes users are spending. And this is where the Snapchat story has kind of changed. I mean, I think what's made Snapchat a $25 billion company is, are you familiar with Snapchat? So how many of you have Snapchat in your phones? You know the Snapchat story thing, right? Basically, it keeps you addicted to Snapchat. My, my kids are old. They have to be on Snapchat no matter how bad the Wi-Fi is because they can't break their story streak, which goes back like 600 days. Incredibly masterful concept because last year, Snapchat, at least based on, its, uh, based on outside statistics, the typical Snapchat user was spending 26 minutes a day on Snapchat. That's the second highest number after Facebook. So they got that intensity story. And they, for the moment, that intensity story is going to take them to a pretty high pricing. But if you're Evan Spiegel and you're running Snapchat, not only do you have to be working on intensity, but you also have to be working on this other channel of how do I convert that intensity to advertising revenues and Snap glasses sold or whatever. Because there will be a bar mitzvah moment for Snapchat. It might not, we don't know when that'll be. That's the problem with trading on users is you never know when the game will change on you. But I think the start is pretty promising in terms of showing that user intensity, but the other half is what I would watch if I were an investor in Snap. So in fact, I've got at least a dozen emails this morning about when are you going to value Snapchat? 
And implicit in every email was the conclusion that I'm going to find it to be massively overvalued. And I don't know yet, because I, I think that the platform is there, and you can see how much value Facebook has got from that having people spend an hour every day. The question with Snapchat is, can they keep people engaged as they have last year? And remember, the, 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 the population that Snapchat goes after is 18 to 25 year olds, the most fickle people on the face of the earth. So the other thing you have to worry about is what if, right? So I think that's, those are the two worries you have. It's can you maintain this process and can you make money of that intensity? So I think they have good things going for them. I wouldn't be as, as quick to decide that they were a worthless company. They, they are a valuable company. The question we have to debate is what's that value? But if you're a trader, you really don't care about the value, right? Because if you can buy at 25 billion and you can get out at 33 billion, you're gonna coast and make that money and let the value kind of take care of its, itself later. Yes? In fact, let me hold off of that because I'm going to actually look at market regressions. And there, because the sample is so much more diverse, I'm going to try to ask the question, should I be using a linear regression or a non-linear? Because it's a statistical. If you're going to open up the statistics book, might as well use the whole thing, right? Because not everything is linear. In fact, very few things in life are linearly related. So we'll come back and look at how to spot that and what to do about it. So when you look at relative valuation, remember that you are pricing your company relative to those other companies you're showing. Now, most of the time when you see pricing, it's always sector focused, right? Basically, you compare a company to the rest of the sector. And if you ask people, why do you stay sector focused? Their answer is a pretty intuitive one. I can't compare to the rest of the market. I can take a software company and compare it to utility. And you say, why not? Because the risk is different, and the cash flows are different, and the growth is different, right? But what if you can control for those differences, which is what the entire focus and regression is? If I can control for those differences, I can pretty much expand my sample. So at the start of every year, I set aside a day where I just explore. So I take PE ratios. And the legend, of course, is higher growth companies of higher PE ratios. I take the entire market. I compute the PE ratio for every company for which I can get a PE ratio, 3,400 companies. I take the companies which have an expected growth rate, which is about 3,000 companies, and I do a scatter plot first. I'm agnostic when I run the scatter plot because the, the, the conventional wisdom is higher growth companies should have higher P, but I do the scatter plot, my first reaction is this is a bloody mess. I mean, this, again, if there is a relationship, it's very tough to see it, right? It's kind of, it's not strong, it's not obvious. I already know that when I run this regression of PE ratios, then I shouldn't expect to see R squares of 80, 85, or 90%, because if your strongest variable looks like this, then the R squared should reflect that. Undaunted, I ran the regression of PE ratios against three variables, growth, beta, and payout. This is not a kitchen sink regression. You know what kitchen sink regression is? We've all been guilty of it in statistics classes. We have a singular objective, which is to maximize our R squared. So what do we do? We try variable after variable until we get there. We throw in the weight of the CEO. It increases the R squared, leave it in there. Companies with fat CEOs are worth more than companies. If it works, who's going to fight it? So this, I'm actually staying focused on the three variables that showed up in my algebra. So I'll start with the bad news first. The R squared of this regression is only 41%. I'm not going to be defensive about it because this wasn't my choice. I wanted to do intrinsic valuation. You wanted to use PE ratios. This is just holding a mirror up to your multiple saying, do you really want to use a PE ratio? It's the most noisy of all of the multiples you can use. The R squared reflects that noise. You know what I mean by noisy, right? The earnings can go up and down. And all kinds of bad things can happen to earnings per share. 41%. That's actually the highest R squared I've had in 22 years of running PE ratio regressions. There have been years where it's been down as low as 17 or 18%. By 2016, the start of the year, it was 41%. Let's break apart the regression. The intercept is 8.79. I'm sorry, 8.76. That's the base from which I'm going to build up my P ratio. There's, don't read too much into it, but other than the overall level of the market is going to be captured there. If the market is up, the P ratio for the entire market is high, the intercept is going to be high. The P for the entire market is, is low, 
the intercept is going to be low. Every 1% increase in growth rates across US companies increases the PE ratio by about 0.75. So if you're a company with a 10% higher expected growth rate than mine, given how US stocks were being priced at the start of 2016, your PE ratio should be roughly 7.5 higher than mine. Every 1% increase in my payout ratio increases my PE ratio by about 0.19. So if you're a company with a 20% higher payout ratio than mine, that should translate into a PE ratio of roughly 3.8 higher than mine. And finally, if your beta is 2 and my beta is 1, every increase of beta of a unit of 1 reduces my PE ratio by about 4.08. The coefficients all cut in the same direction, but don't get too used to that. Again, in the 22 years that I've run this regression, I've sometimes got strange-looking coefficients. Like what? I've got a positive coefficient on beta. Riskier companies have higher. You think, why would that happen? It goes back to the multicollinearity. And in fact, you can see the multicollinearity play out when I show you how these variables move together. And you're going to see very quickly why, when they start to move together, the coefficients can do strange things for you. So there are two things that I'm, I'm assuming when I run these regressions. The first is payout growth and risk are independent variables, uncorrelated. The second is the relationship is a linear one. Both are assumptions. Let's at least look at the correlation assumption. I took the variables, my independent variables, growth, payout, and beta, and I ran this correlation matrix. Now, if this, uh, if this is a regression that passes the statistical test, here's what I should see. Everything off the diagonal should be zero. In other words, the variables should be uncorrelated with each other. There's zero chance of that happening. And here's why. High growth companies tend to have low payout ratios and often high betas. I have a regression that is rife with multicollinearity. And again, here's why it can affect your regression. Remember, the, all the computer sees are four columns of numbers, right? Let's suppose all your high growth companies have high betas. After a while, when the regression is run, the computer doesn't know whether beta measures risk or whether it measures growth. Beta can actually become a bigger proxy for growth than for risk. That's the problem with multicollinearity, and that's why in some years when you run this regression, you can get strange looking output. Is there something you can do about it? All these little statistical tricks you can try. If this were a statistics slide, you could spend the entire 15 weeks tweaking this regression, adjusting it. But this isn't a statistics slide. Basically, what I want is a forecast that works. And remember, the collective regression still works for me. And as long as it works, why would I want to involve myself with the rest of the stuff? But it's actually a fascinating statistical problem. How exactly you control for these differences when you make these forecasts. If you want a regression that's truly independent, there are ways, as I said, of doing it. But I'm not going to go down those roads. So here's why these market regressions are useful to me. I, as I said, I run these regressions. I post them on my, uh, on my website. You can find the regressions for you know, PE ratios priced above. Let's suppose you come to me with the stock. You give me the numbers for the stock, the beta, the payout, and the growth. And you say, can you give me a quick pricing? Is this a you know, cheap stock or an expensive stock? I don't have the time to do a full-fledged DCF. I don't even have the time to run a peer group analysis with all this stuff. But here's what I can do. I can plug the numbers for your company into this market regression. So as an example, let's assume that I've got this market regression and I'm trying to price Disney. And Disney has an expected growth rate of 15%, and that comes from the same database from which I got the rest of the company. So I've got to stay consistent. A payout ratio of 20% a beta 1.25. I'm going to plug those numbers in. So if you look at the regression from two days ago, no, and this is, I think, from... No. So there's the coefficient. So basically, I took the regression. I plug in the numbers for Disney into that regression. I, I, I did the, the number crunching at the bottom. So let me just pull up what those number crunching would give me. I get 18.89 as my predicted P. So if I plug Disney's numbers into this market regression, I get a P of 18.89. It's actually trading at 20 times earnings. So if I trust my regression with absolute certitude, the stock looks overpriced or underpriced? Overpriced. The P ratio is too high. The only problem is when you run a regression, you get a predicted value. In many regression packages, you'll also get a range around that predicted value. 
that range is going to be pretty big for Disney, right? Why? Because the P-E ratio, the R squared, is a very quick indicator of what kind of range you should expect to see. If your R squared is 100%, then you get a perfect prediction. If it's any number less than 100%, there's a range at a 41%. The range around my predicted value with 90% confidence is somewhere between 17 and 22. Plus or minus two stand pairs. 20 times earnings is somewhere in the middle. This is, a, this is one of those cases where I get a range from a prediction, and all I can say about Disney is it looks fairly valued. You can be a one-person hedge fund, right? You better trust this regression, absolutely then, but you could take this regression, get predicted PEs for every single US, US stock, compare the actual to the predicted, buy the 100 cheapest, sell short on the 100 most expensive, then get down on your knees and hope and pray that all the points move towards the regression line. That's really what you don't control. But if you've heard of a, of a lot of quant hedge funds, this is what they do in spades. I mean, they clearly don't start, stop at a multiple regression with linear coefficients, but the data is there, and if you can create a rich enough way of predicting P's or price to books, and EV to EBIT does, you can see how this can become a tool to decide what's cheap and what's expensive. Any questions? Now, one other number that came, comes out of the regression that I've kept track of over time is that coefficient on growth. January 2016, that coefficient was 0.75. So every 1% increase in growth translates into an increase in P of 0.75. And as you can see, the number has changed over time. So one way to read that number is that's what the market is willing to pay for growth. Remember the implied equity risk premium that I came up with for the S&P 500? That's what the market is charging for taking risks. So the equity risk premium measures what the market is charging for risk. The coefficient on growth measures what it's willing to pay for growth. If you're a risky growth company, what does Nirvana look like to you? You want a low price for risk and a high price for growth, right? You get the best of both worlds then. Go back to January 2000. Market is paying 2.1% for every 1% of growth and charging almost nothing for risk. So you know what's, what you're going to see with high growth, high risk companies in early 2000? They're going to be trading at 150 times earnings, 200 times earnings, because the market is charging very little for risk and paying a high price for growth. You see the correction? Two years later, what the market is willing to pay for growth has more than halved. The, what the market is charging for risk has almost doubled. Same company two years later, same numbers, the 150 times earnings is going to become 50 times earnings. So when we think about growth and risk, we know the direction of the relationship. We know the market charges you for risk and pays you for growth, but what the market is charging and paying can vary across time. So one of the things I'm interested in is looking in January 2017 and how those numbers have changed after the last year, especially leading into, you know, a new administration, new tax laws coming, new emphasis on where the investments are going to be made. It would be interesting to see whether these numbers have shifted. We know the risk premium over the course of this year hasn't changed much, but we don't know what will happen between now and January 1st. It would be interesting to see what the price of growth is now across companies, especially as you're seeing these shifts across sectors. Tech stocks are down and infrastructure stocks are up. How it will play out, I have no idea, but I'm just interested to find out. Any questions? So I did that with PE, and I said, why stop at PE? Why not try PEG? The price, you know. I took the PEG ratios, and I ran that scatter plot against growth. Again, I get this very strange relationship, but you can also notice, and this might be just my eyeballing the data, it looks like there's some kind of curve to the relationship, right? In other words, it does not look linear. It's a point that, that was made, made earlier about, you know, that Michelle made earlier about what do I do about nonlinear relationships. First thing is to see it. And the only way you see it is with a scatter plot. So if you have a nonlinear relationship, what do you do? I fall back on the role ploy. Whenever I'm in doubt, I take the natural log. I don't ask me why. It seemed to work 95% of the time. So I took the natural log, and I know this might be just eyeballing, but the relationship looks a little more linear with natural logs. So compare the two. There's my regular growth. There's log of expected growth. When I ran my regression for peg ratios, that was what I changed. Instead of running the regression against growth rates, I ran it against the natural log of growth rates. 
So before you run a regression, you might want to take a scatter plot of each of the three or four variables you have in a regression. Just eyeball the data. There are actually statistical tests for linearity that you can use if you're, if you're interested. And if something is nonlinear, there are ways of fixing that nonlinearity. In, in, at least in financial data, the natural log seems to fix nine out of 10 of those problems because it's just a question of range. But if it works, just move to a natural log, and the rest of the analysis still follows. So there's my regression for peg ratios with the same three variables, growth, payout, and risk, based upon what the algebra told me I should be controlling for. So you can already see the template for what I do at the start of every year. I take every, every multiple, I do this regression looking across the market. And again, if you want, you can put the numbers into a company and see what it gives you. One, one problematic aspect of this particular regression was the intercept was negative. You think, so what? When you have a negative intercept, you can actually end up with a negative peg ratio for a company, right, when you plug in the numbers, which I don't want because it doesn't even make sense. It's not meaningful. So if you have a traditional statistics package like SPSS or Minitab, there's actually in most of these packages an option of removing the intercept. It's, as I said, not great practice because it forces the line through your regression line through the intercept. But if you have a very negative intercept, and you're worried about your predicted values turning negative, all you can do is actually take out the intercept, rerun the regression without a constant, without the intercept. It's not the best fit line anymore because you force the line through, but you now have the problem gone away. So this is the peg ratio regression without the intercept. And you can see the coefficients have all shifted because I've moved the line. But the, at least the sign of the coefficients have stayed the same. So this would be my regression that I would use to get a predicted peg ratio for a company. So with every multiple, I run the regression. The multiple, if the intercept is a big negative number, I rerun it without the intercept so I can get more reasonable predictions. And that's the number I would use then to get my predicted peg ratio for a company. So by now, I've done enough market regressions. You can get a sense. I don't want to go through each one. But I run these regressions across the US, then I do Europe, then I do Japan because I have the data in front of me. So these are the PE ratio regressions that I ran at the start of 2016. US, Europe, Japan, emerging markets. First notice the R squares vary across markets. Nothing I can do about it, just reflects the fact that it's much more difficult to predict a PE ratio in an emerging market than in the US. No surprise there. The coefficients that I used were exactly the same across markets. Remember what I said. What you have as your coefficient on growth tells you what markets are paying for growth. And you can see the price for growth varies across markets, that you're not getting very much for higher growth in emerging markets, much lower coefficient on growth. So the coefficients are the same. The signs of the coefficients are the same. And it's actually, to me, what I get out of these regressions is how much market share in common. We tend to talk about market differences, but how much at the core they're connected is what you get out of these regressions. So if you go to my website, you can actually you know, play with these regressions. If you have a Japanese company that you're valuing, just plug the numbers in the regression. You get a predicted PE for your company, given how Japanese stocks were priced at the start of 2016. That's a caveat, though. This is the start of 2016. We're in November of 2016. These regressions are dated, but you don't have the luxury of, you can run the regressions yourself. The data is there. You can wait till January 2016, but your project will then be really, really late. So for the moment, all you have is the January 2016 numbers. Just plug in and see what you get. So I'll just, you know, I do this for price to book, growth and earnings per share, beta payout. Notice what the fourth variable that pops up is? The return equity. Why? Because when you ran the algebra, return. And if you look at the return equity, it is by far the dominant variable explaining changes in price to book across markets. The other interesting thing is on, in every single market, I get a higher R squared using price to book ratios and PE ratios. That's why I said PE ratios are the most noisy, most difficult multiples to explain away. But again, look at what they share in common, because that's what I would take out of these regressions. Here's EV to EBITDA, growth, cost to capital, debt ratio. And the growth that I used here was growth in revenues rather than growth in earnings per share. The reason is enterprise value is a firm multiple, not an equity multiple. If all you have is growth in earnings per share, that's fine. But if you have growth in revenues, might as well use it. Again. R squared, I don't even know what that R squared was in Japan, but it's not a good number. We're all less than 10% in every single market. I had a really tough time with EV to EBITDA multiples, at least in 2016. 
Now, I, I don't want to explore why. I'm not interested in finding out why, but it'll be interesting to see whether the numbers bounce back in 2017. And finally, EV to sales. Again, the variable that you see popping up is operating margin. So again, with every single multiple, I'm going to go back to the algebra, say these are the variables I should be controlling for. This is what the regression looks like across markets. So when I'm done, I end up with these 50 different regressions, different multiples, different markets. And I can pick and choose which one I want to use to decide how to price companies in that market. So here are my final propositions on pricing. In a pricing, when you come to a conclusion, it's always a conditional conclusion. So when you tell me something is cheap, it's given the multiple you're using and given the comparables that you're comparing it to. Second, in intrinsic valuation, now we value company by itself. In pricing, you have to find similar companies. And if there's no, nothing else you've seen as you've gone through these examples, is there's no such thing as an exactly identical company. So when you say companies are similar, there is a subjective judgment you're making that shows up in your pricing. And much of what you see out there that passes for valuation is pricing. So the best way to kind of cement this is pick up a few equity research reports, right? See what the, the analyst is using. See how much pricing goes in. As I said, don't pass judgments. Not bad to price companies. You just have to do it right. Have they dotted their I's, crossed their T's? Because that's what separates good pricing from bad pricing. So let's close the pricing section by talking about choices we have to make. As I said, when you in this one, the start of the class, we looked at this choice. So you, run, you price your company with 10, 11, 12 different multiples. You get different prices for your company. You have three choices. You can use a simple average of the numbers, which is awful because you're putting the good stuff with the bad stuff. You can use a weighted average where you have to decide what the weights are going to be. You'd like the weights to be higher in your more precise multiples and lower in your less precise multiples, or you can pick one of the multiples and build your entire pricing around it. I would encourage you to actually go with the last one because when you try to bring you know, seven different multiples, ten different multiples into a pricing, strange things can happen. And when you think about picking that one multiple, the cynical answer is pick the multiple that makes your story the easiest one to tell. But if you don't want to be a cynic and you want to be a quant person, you can pick the multiple that you can best explain. So if you've been running regressions across eight different multiples, pick the one which is the highest R squared. But if you feel that's too mechanical, pick the multiple that makes the most sense for the company that you're pricing. So how the hell would I know what that is? Put yourself in the shoes of managers in that company. Okay? Think about what they focus on when they manage a company. So I'll give you three examples. When you look at retailers and you look at their earnings reports, there's a huge focus on two things. Same store sets, because that's better than opening new stores. It's more efficient. And the other is margins. So if you're focused on margins as a company, the multiple that makes the most sense given that focus is a revenue multiple. You go into banks and financial service companies, huge focus on return and equity. If your focus is on return and equity, the multiple that makes the most sense is price to book ratios. If you go into technology companies, huge focus on growth, the multiple that makes the most sense given that focus is PE ratios. We talked about companion variables. You tell me what your focus is. I'm going to flip it around and say this is the multiple that makes the most sense. And it's surprising how well that works in picking the right multiple to use in pricing your company. So start thinking about your company, the big project company. Think about what, when you did your DCF, what was the thing that worried you the most? What was the biggest driver of value? Because odds are that's going to give you a signal as to what multiple will work best for your company. So I'll close by going back to those 550 equity research reports that I talked about at the start of this class. Okay. Remember the ones that I used to decide what, what do I equity research analysts do? So I went back into those 550 equity research reports, and I looked at what kind of multiple analysts tended to use in each sector. So this is just a, an empirical statement. I'm not saying this is the right multiple to use, but this is what analysts seem to use. Among cyclical manufacturing companies like housing, automobiles, et cetera, I saw a lot of PE ratios with earnings based on normalized earnings. In other words, they used average earnings over time. With growth firms, I saw a lot of peg ratios. Again, because of this delusion that by using peg ratios, you're controlling for differences in growth. With young growth firms with losses, you saw a lot of revenue multiples simply because of desperation. You couldn't use any other multiple. 
With infrastructure firms, cable, cellular, telecom, you see a lot of EV to EBITDA. Why? Because even if you're losing money, by the time you add back the DA, you end up with a positive number and the multiple seems to work. With REITs, real estate investment trusts, you see price to cash earnings. It's the only sector where I see this used where people add depreciation back to net income. So instead of dividing price by earnings, they divide price by net income plus depreciation. With financial service companies, a lot of price to book. It's a dominant multiple in use. And with retailing, you see a lot of revenue multiples. Used to be price to sales. Now increasingly, I see more EV to sales with leases treated as debt. So when you look at a sector, there's already an established multiple that you don't have to go with the multiple, at least get familiar with what other people are looking at when they look at companies in the sector. So in pricing, you come up with the number for your company. In intrinsic valuation, you come up with the number for your company. Let's say you do both right. You'd follow every rule in the book. You do your intrinsic valuation, you come up with the number. You do a pricing, you come up with the number. I've kind of given away the answer multiple times in these last few sessions. Will you get the same number? No, because it's two different. You're doing two different things. It's not because one is right and the other is wrong. In one, you're asking, what is the value of this company given its fundamentals? The other asking, what is the pricing for this company given how the market is pricing other companies? And if the numbers are different, which they are for you, ultimately, remember, you've got to make a recommendation, buy, sell, or hold. So you're going to be faced with this judgment to make on December 14th, or hopefully if you're doing your project in time, December 12th, maybe December 10th. So you have a value for your company and a price that are different numbers. Let's say they pull you in different directions. One says buy, the other says sell. I'll give you some choices to how you can make it. You could base it on intrinsic value. You could base it on your pricing. You could base it on some composite of the two which I've seen a lot of IPO valuations and equity research reports, where people who do a pricing and they'll do a DCF and they'll add the two and divide by two. That's like saying you're going to be a Muslim in the morning and a Buddhist in the afternoon. It doesn't work. There's going to be this midpoint there where you're going to have this huge existential crisis as to what exactly you are. It doesn't work. You have to pick your poison. And in this case, whether you pick value or price is really going to depend on whether you want to be an investor or a trader. If you're an investor, you're going to go with the value. But then be willing to, do, to live like an investor, right? Wait a long time, be patient. If those are things that don't come easily to you, don't even try it. It's not going to work. Go back to being a trader, in which case all you care about is the price. So early on in this process, you've got to make a judgment as to what you want to do. Do you want to value companies and invest in them, or do you want to price companies and trade them? And you can be good at both, right? There are traders who have made millions, there are investors who have made millions, there are traders who have lost millions, investors who have lost millions. You can be good at either, but you, I think what gets people into trouble is they can't make up their mind. They go back and forth and back and forth, and that is a recipe for disaster. So define, describe, analyze, apply. Anytime you see a multiple, and you're going to see dozens that we haven't talked about in class that haven't been invented yet that you're going to see in front of you. One big thing that people are working on now is value per customer. It's a big deal in marketing now. How do you value a customer? You can do whatever multiple you want, but take it through the four-step process. Start off by defining the multiple. Is it consistently defined? Is it uniformly estimated? Describe the multiple. Draw the histograms across the data that you have. Analyze the multiple. Do that algebra. Equity multiple, go back to a DCF, a dividend discount model. Firm multiple, go back to a firm valuation model and only then apply the multiple. And if you follow this four-step process, you're going to be OK no matter how complex a newer multiple is, because you can catch the problems as you go along and control for the variables you should be controlling for. Any questions about any aspect of relative valuation? So let's take a little detour. In intrinsic valuation, you value a company based on cash flows, growth, and risk. In pricing, you price a company based on how similar companies are priced out there. Let's take a detour and do what's called asset-based valuation. In asset-based valuation, what you do is instead of valuing the entire company, you value the assets that it owns. In other words, you go to the balance sheet and say, these are the six things you own. Let me value each one separately. You say, why would I want to do that? There are three cases where you might want to value the assets of a company rather than value the whole company. 
The first is if you're liquidating the company, and you can see why, right? Because you're going to sell off each asset in the marketplace. You want to attach a number to each one separately. It could be because you have an accounting mission. Fair value accounting is all about valuing assets. You've got to have a balance sheet. You've got to tell me not just the value of the company, but how much of that value comes from brand name, how much comes from physical assets. Or it might be because you're an active as investor interested in buying this company and breaking it up. Right? Because then you're saying the value of the company broken up in, into its assets is greater than the value of the company as a going concern. So there will be cases where rather than valuing the whole company, you want to value it in pieces. So let's think about the, three, the choices in terms of how you come up with these numbers. The first is you can do an intrinsic value of each piece. And to do that, what do you need? You need cash flows, growth, and risk for each piece. You do a value of each piece. You could do a pricing for each piece, in which case you take each asset and you try to apply a PE ratio or EV to EBITDA or a price to book to come up with a value. Or you can take a book value for each one. So when we talk about doing a sum of the parts valuation, we have to be precise as to what exactly we're going to try to do. So let's think about when asset-based valuation is going to work best for you. Asset-based valuation works, works best if you have separable assets. I'll give you a classic example. You have a real estate holding company with 10, pieces, 10 properties as your assets. Asset-based valuation is simple. I can take each property and value it separately, add the 10 up, and come up with a value for your company. But let's suppose I came to you with Coca-Cola. Right? And say, do an asset-based valuation. And I said, one of the assets is brand name, the other is the physical. It's going to be much more difficult to separate where the brand name ends and where everything else begins. Much more difficult to do in Coca-Cola than at a real estate holding company. Second, it's nice if each piece has its own earnings and cash flows. So if you can tell me what each property makes, and you should be able to. I can value each property. But if I'm getting a consolidated number, and I don't know which part of your company is delivering that number, much more difficult to do asset-based valuation. And third, it's nice if there is an active market out there for each of these assets. That's why real estate-based valuation is so simple, because when I want to put a number on a property, there are other properties that are being sold out there, and I can say, this is the price I would put on this property, given those other properties. So it's much easier to do asset-based valuation in some companies than others. So the next time you read about an activist investor targeting a company because the sum of the parts is greater than the whole, one of the things you want to examine is what's a company being targeted. If you're targeting a company where the pieces are all entangled together and it's difficult to separate, it's going to be much more difficult to get the sum of the parts value for that company than a company where the parts can each be individually valued. Okay. So let's start with liquidation valuation. Depressing valuation, right? Because you're shutting the company down. You're going to basically take whatever you can. When you're doing liquidation valuation, I really think you shouldn't even be doing valuation. You should be doing pricing. Think of why. In liquidation valuation, what are you trying to get? You're trying to get what you will get if you sell your assets in the market today. This has nothing to do with cash flows, growth, and risk. It's got everything to do with what other people will be willing to pay for that asset today. The sloppy answer to liquidation valuation that many people use is just use the book value. You must have more faith in accountants than you do when you use book value. Because I don't think book value measures liquidation value at most companies. But liquidation value emission is what will I get for these assets if I sell them in the marketplace today, which is a pricing. And you might have to accept a discount. Do you see why I might have, you might have to accept a discount? If you're trying to sell dozens of assets and there aren't that many buyers, the liquidation valuation for a company might be much less than what a fair pricing would be if you were able to sell it over time. So that's the first one. Accounting valuation. About 10 years ago, there was accounting fair, the, when the accounting rule writers were writing the fair value rules, they met in New York as a panel, and they had lots of people come in front of them and talk about what they should be doing. So I got this call a week before they were meeting and said, will you be willing to come in and talk to us about what you think about fair value accounting? And I said, you've heard what I've said about accounting, right? They said, oh, that's OK. You can come in still. And so they sent me this rule that they were going to base it on called FAS 157. They said, take a look. This is what we're planning to do. So I won't read the entire FAS 157 to you, but if you break down FAS 157, here's what they want accountants to do in fair value accounting. They want you to attach a number to an asset based upon what a market participant will be willing to pay today 
in an arm's length transaction. Let me repeat that again. Fair value accounting requires you to put a number in an asset that a market participant would be willing to pay today in an arm's length transaction. Does that sound like a value statement or a pricing statement to you? This is a pricing statement. My first suggestion to them is, why are you calling it fair value accounting? Can we call it fair price accounting? Because that's closer to the truth. Because you're going to put accountants in a horrible place if you give them a fair pricing mission and then ask them to turn in DCFs to justify those prices, which is what the state of the process is in fair value accounting today. We have a fair pricing mission, and then we're asking accountants for DCFs to back it up. It is an impossible mission. Every week you have accounting firms struggling with this mission all over the world because it's in, the mission is, doesn't make sense. You're asked to price something and say, show me a DCF to back it up. So if you truly want to make it fair value accounting, then you've got to rewrite FAS 157, and you can use DCFs, or you can keep FAS 157 as is and then require accountants to show what? To justify their numbers. Use a multiple in comparables. Let's stop this nonsense about DCFs and fair value accounting because it's fair price accounting. So now let's talk about some of the parts valuation. You'll often hear analysts say, well, Disney could be worth as this, more as the sum of its parts than as a standalone company. Sony could be worth more as the sum of its parts than a standalone company. And you think they've done some serious analysis breaking this company down to come up with that conclusion, right? So let's dig a little deeper. Let's think about how you can do a sum of the parts valuation, and then let's also talk about a sum of the parts pricing. I'm going to use a company that some of you might be familiar with called United Technologies. Think of it as a poor man's GE. So it's not as complex as GE, but has some, many of the same characteristics. It's in six different businesses. And actually, one of the nice things about United Technologies is if you go into their 10K or annual report, they break down lots of detail based on the six businesses. Very different businesses. They have a refrigeration systems unit called Carrier, a defense unit called Pratt & Whitney, a construction unit, basically elevators, Otis, a security unit called UTC Fire and Security, a manufacturing unit called Hamilton Sunstrand, and an aircraft unit called Sikorsky. Six very different businesses. And they actually break down revenues and EBITDA and pre-tax operating income and capex and depreciation, everything down by division. So I looked at it and said, I'd like to value United Technologies as a, as a sum of its parts. I also did a full-fledged intrinsic valuation of United Technologies as a full company, but I wanted to compare that valuation to the sum of its parts. One thing they did mention after the breakdown is they also had what they called corporate expenses. This is general expenses of 408 million, which is not uncommon, right? If you have a big company, you always have these G&A costs that go to corporate, 408 million, which we'll talk about as we go through this intrinsic valuation because I can't ignore it. That's an actual expense each year. So in order to attach a number, here's what I did first. I decided to do a very simplistic back of the envelope pricing of the sectors. So I took the EBITDA for each sector, which they'd reported. I took the median EV to EBITDA for the sectors that each of these sec companies was in. I multiplied the EBITDA by that median, and I came up with a value for each business. This is something you could do in the back of an envelope after a cocktail party. Basically, it doesn't take much work. You just apply the numbers. The value that I get, the pricing that I get for this company, if I do this, is $61.7 billion. Next time you see an equity research analyst talk about some of the parts, this is pretty much what's been done to back up that statement. It's a very, very naive way of doing it because it's not even a good pricing, right? Because you're applying the median value. What should I be controlling for? Growth and risk and cash flows. How did I control for that when I did a good pricing? I ran a regression across this sector. I looked for differences across companies. Here's what I did. I took each sector. And I ran regressions of different multiples. I picked the multiple that had the highest R squared in each sector. And that's why you see different multiples for different sectors. So basically, these multiples were picked because they had the highest R squares. So if I look at refrigeration systems, the multiple that seemed to have the most explanatory power is EV to EBITDA. There's a regression for the sector. And I plugged, that number, plugged the numbers for United Technologies into that regression. So for each sector then, Rather than just apply the median value, I'm going to use these regressions. Plug the numbers in. 
for United Technologies and the pricing that I get for United Technologies, and this it's still a pricing, but it's a slightly more controlled pricing, is 74 billion. Just to give you a contrast, the value that I got with the median numbers was 66 billion. The value that I'm getting for with the regressions is about 74 billion. So when we come back, when are we coming back? Are we coming back? Yeah, we will come back. Okay. So all these, you know. So when we come back on Monday, we will complete the process by doing a full-fledged intrinsic valuation of these pieces. But that's the pricing, at least for the moment. So that's why I said you have to hope and pray it moves towards the average, is because it's hope and pray it can create arbitrage. It can create what is an informed trading, which is basically that, that you made the odds move in your favor. But I've seen stocks take two times three standard deviations away from that line for three, five, seven years before the adjustment happens, because it might just be that whatever momentum carried them there keeps them there for much longer period. So sprouts, I think is overpriced. But if you ask me, when will the correction hit? Could be next year, could be three years. Yeah, but aren't those firms with tons of money just doing this all of the time? Yeah. Until very few of them at the time horizon. First, playing the long, the short side of the game, long term, which is really tough to do. How do you go short on sprouts for three years, right? It's not the kind of short. So selling short on sprouts, you're going to get three to six months, even for the sophisticated hedge funds. So what happens is on one side of the transaction, you can buy and hold. The other side of the transaction, the time horizon is constrained. So even the big hedge funds work with constrained time horizons. And that's what creates a risk in this job. Yeah. You can't sit in the way. There's no 20 year selling short strategy. Yeah. And that's one of the great asymmetries in market. Where it's just easy to take advantage of undervalued. It's much more difficult to take advantage of those yeah. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Good job. Hi. Nice to meet you. Uh, 
Ohio Senate would be now the uh, Alaska State Senate. So, uh, would, you, would you take the question? I did. Yeah. 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 Yeah.